सो हाई एवरी वन टूडे टेकिंग अ ब्रेक फ्रॉम जनरेटिव ए आई आई विल बी डिस्कसिंग अबाउट अ मेजर एडवांसमेंट मेड इन द फील्ड ऑफ न्यूरल नेटवर्क दैट इज द इनकमिंग ऑफ कॉलमोगोर ऑफ आर्नल नेटवर्क विच आर कंसिडर्ड टू बी अ सुपीरियर अल्टरनेटिव टू मल्टीलेट परसेप्ट्रॉन्स दैट इज अ कन्वेंशनल न्यूरल नेटवर्क अकॉर्डिंग टू द पेपर दे हैव क्लेम सो इन दिस पर्टिकुलर पोस्ट वी विल बी टॉकिंग अबाउट दीज फोर कॉन्सेप्ट the first is the kolmogorov arnold representation theorem on which the entire idea is based on second is what is b splines third are what are kans that is a short form for the name of the network and its advantages and disadvantages over mlps that is a multi layered perceptrons so let's get started so first of all we'll try to understand the theorem which is the core of the whole idea so the theorem states that given a very complex function for example uh, f of x y z so in this case we are considering just three input variables it but it can be more that in takes three inputs and gives you one output the theorem states that such a complex function can be broken down into a combination of 1d functions by 1d we mean that univariate functions this is particularly a 3d function that means it takes three input variables so the first step would be we will be taking each of the three inputs x y z and pass them through some simple 1d function that are univariate function so just for understanding assume these functions to be in our case as we are taking three inputs x square sin y log z plus 1 right so the three 1d functions that we are applying to individual inputs are these three functions so eventually once the interior of step is done we get this particular output a into x square plus b into sin y plus c into log z plus 1 where abc are constants so basically this particular combination that we are trying to get approximating the 3d function using a combination of 1d function is in two steps the first one was the interior step where we applied the 1d function to each of the input variable as you can see here and the next step we would be again applying a 1d function over the summation of all the three univariate functions that we have applied in the first step so the final approximation for f of x y z would be this where for example if this particular function is root x so the final approximation would look something like this d into under root of the whole of output that we got from the first interior step that is the summation of x square plus sin y plus log z plus 1 where a b c d are all constants so just this was a very layman example act in actual scenario the function used are not that easy so instead of trying to approximate the complex 3d function directly we are breaking down into smaller 1d pieces in the interior combining their outputs by some uh, by adding them together and then on the entire summation value we are again providing a 1d function this two step process can theoretically approximate any continuous multivariate function to arbitrary accuracies according to the theorem so i hope you would be able to get the gist of the theorem that any complex function can now be broken down into a combination of 1d functions the 1d functions that we showed in the example above aren't that easy so it was just for explanation purposes but the functions that are used are called as b splines so what is b splines so b splines are a special type of functions that are defined by piece wise polynomials and are connected at certain point called that nodes knots so i'll be telling you what is a piece wise polynomial and knots as well so first of all jumping to piece wise polynomial a polynomial which has a different representation at different intervals of the value so uh, looking at this particular example if you see m into x plus a m into x plus n into x square when the value of x is greater than 5 less than 10 and when the value of x is 10 it is greater than 10 it is p into x cube so basically you can see that for different intervals of x p wise polynomial is having different expressions now what are not points so the point at which the definition is started changing is called as a not point in this particular example the not points are 5 and 10 because once x hits a 5 the definition changes from first expression to second and when the value of x hits a 10 it goes here 
Now, depending upon the degrees of spline, different possible basis functions are used to construct the actual function. So, for example, a B spline of degree 0 would look something like this f of x equals to 1, where the degree of the variable x is 0. Hence, it would be a constant function. Degree 1 would look something like this f of x 1, f of x equals to x. So, it would be a combination of two functions. Remember that. Uh, degree 2, the basis function would look something like this. So, what are basically basis functions? First of all, I will jumping on that. They are a set of simple functions that can be used to represent a complex function. Assume that we have got this particular function 5 plus 2x square. Now, the different basis functions that we can use is f of 1, f of 2, f of 3. Assume that these are the basis functions that we have got. Now, the representation of this particular function can be done using these smaller basis functions. 5 into f of 1 as the value of uh, f1 equals to 1, it is a constant. 0 into f of 2 as f of 2 equals to x and 2 into f of 3x square. So, the final equation we get is 5 into 1 plus 0 into x plus 2 into x square, eventually the final equation. So, basically a B spline function would consist of basis function with particular degree and less than that degree. So, if the degree of a B, B spline function is 2, it would include basis functions of degree 2, degree 1 and degree 0. Similarly, if the B spline has a degree 1, basically it will include basis functions of degree 0 that is a constant alongside uh, a polynomial with degree 1 that is f of x equals to x as you can see. This might be a little complex to understand but if you uh, pay some attention you would be able to get it. Now coming to the core of this particular tutorial that is what are KNs. But before jumping on to KANs we need to understand how does a multi-layer perceptron works? So, if you have worked with uh, conventional neural networks at any bandwidth, you must be aware of this particular equation where x1, x2, x3, xn are the input, w1, w2, wn are the weights, weight matrix that we train. We add them together and then eventually apply an activation function. So, the process looks something like this. We have scalar weight values that we multiply with each of the input. We add them together and then apply some activation function, which can be sigmoid, ReLU, etc. Now, if you look into this particular equation, there is a issue here. If you get a very, very complex non-linear relationship to get captured by the neural network, only this activation function that we are using would be contributing into capturing that non-linearity. This particular part, the interior, W into X1, W2 into X2, is just capturing the linear part. So eventually it might take some time or such a neural network might not able to capture high complexity relationships. What if this particular part where we are multiplying the scalar weights to the inputs can also be made non-linear so that eventually the network is able to capture non-linearity. So this is what KANs are doing. So instead of having a scalar weight that we multiply with the inputs, KANs have learnable non-linear activation functions. So that's the only difference that we have between the MLP and KANs. What are these non-linear learnable functions? Basically, the B-spline functions that we talked earlier are the non-linear learnable functions. So cutting it short, in case of an MLP, what we are doing? We are multiplying the corresponding weights to the input. We add them together and then apply an activation function. But in case of a KAN, we are applying a 1D learnable function to each of the input omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, adding them together and then applying another activation function which is 1D function. So eventually in case of an MLP, the activation function that we apply are not learnable. These are constant, be it sigmoid, be it uh, ReLU. But in case of KANs, the final activation function that we are applying outside is also learnable in nature. So this is the final equation that we get for every hidden layer and eventually this is what it relates from the representation theorem that we explained. A query might be coming to your mind that uh, why these 1D functions are called as learnable? Because these functions are having some parameters that are tunable, that are to be learned. For example, omega 1 might look something like this, a into x square plus b into x. It is a function, do remember that. Similarly, Omega 2 might look something like this, 
c into sin y plus d into cos y these are examples do remember this uh, in reality things are a little complex so these constant these values c d a b are now to be learned instead of scalar weight values now what are the advantages of using a kan as claimed in the paper smaller kans can achieve comparable or better accuracies than mlps it does make sense because in a smaller number of hidden layers now the neural network is able to capture non linearity much better as compared to an mlp a kans are shown to possess faster neural scaling laws than mlp this means that as the size of the network increases the performance improves rapidly so basically if more and more hidden layers are added more and more complexity can be captured and as mentioned in the paper they can be intuitively visualized now grass is not greener on the other side always there are a few issues as well with kans as people have pointed out training kans may be very slow because instead of now tuning a single scalar weight for each of the input values you might be tuning out multiple parameters as you saw in this particular example a into x square plus b into x. Now there are two parameters to be trained instead of a just one w one weight. Heavy computation resources are required, and as model itself require heavy computational resources, training with big data can be challenging. So with this, it's a wrap. I hope you are able to understand what are KANs and the representation theorem and how KANs have advantages as well as disadvantages over MLP. Thank you so much.